I'm Vios, this is Bradley, and as he said, we'll be talking about Freud today. Um, so to give you a bit of an overview on this before we delve too deep into Freud itself, uh, I wanted to give a brief overview of what particle simulation exactly is and, and what kinds of science we're interested in. So in general, when we're talking about partic particle simulation, um, we're talking about nano or micron scale particles, so dealing either with atoms and molecules or perhaps some sort of slightly larger scale assembly of these things. And we're performing simulations where we do some sort of time integration. So you start off with particles in some position, and then over time they move around and hopefully they order into something interesting. So the most standard way of doing this is a method called molecular dynamics. It's pretty old. Uh, I posted one of the very first papers that, uh, that was done with this. This was back at Los Alamos in like the 50s with Enrico Fermi. And their simulations involved 64 particles, I believe. Uh, and they were investigating the behavior of certain nonlinear terms if you interact in certain ways. Uh, so this is what they did back in the 50s. Um, and there's been sort of at the time, there were some sort of minor advancements right, being made. So the next uh, important work they're posting is by Alder and Wainwright. Um, it's a seminal paper talking about hard sphere simulations. So this is one of the sort of classical uh, simple models that's been used in the field. Uh, and the idea is to treat particles as billiard balls that sort of bounce off each other. So again, you just integrate forward Newtonian mechanics, uh, but you have very, very simple equations of motion. So really, this sort of field took off with a much broader um, community when it was realized that it could be used to, to do biomolecular simulations. And so what I've put up here is the first usage of molecular dynamics to simulate proteins, in particular protein folding. So this was a paper in the 70s, and it was sort of the first work showing that this could be done. So back when all of these were done, everyone was writing their own code, doing whatever they needed to do to get their specific simulations to work. Uh, in the time since then, we've really developed lots of well-defined tools that are high performance, uh, easily customizable, and can do these sort of simulations. And so instead of everyone developing their codes, typically these are some, some of the standard code tools that are used. So uh, LAMPS, HUMD Blue, um, Charm, Amber's another big one, Gromax. Uh, this is just sort of a sampling of the most popular tools that are used for this. So now if we fast forward 50, 60 years to simulations that have been done in the last decade, the scales are completely different, right? The, the first simulations I talked about were these 64 particle systems. Uh, now we're talking about millions of particles. So this was a part, uh, paper published a couple years ago on these massively parallel systems. Um, here's another one talking about uh, running million particle systems to calculate um, quantities, not just based on a single simulation, but now on a whole um, host of simulations. So you do an ensemble of simulations and calculate average properties across them. So the scales are continuing to grow. Uh, and finally, here's a, a picture of a viral capsid. So this is a large macromolecule right, with lots of complex physics involved. And this is something that now we can simulate on pseudo reasonable time scales. So, Part of the challenge now is that we have these extremely powerful simulation engines, like the ones that we've talked about, uh, but you need a way to analyze now this enormous quantity of data. And there's sort of various standard analyses that people like to do, right? So the cartoon on the right of this shows some of these uh, mean squared displacements, talking about how particles typically move around. Um, radial distribution functions, things like that, uh, tell you something about local densities, um, correlation functions. So there's a lot of sort of standard analyses. And our goal here is to, to simplify the process of, of doing these calculations efficiently on large simulations using Freud. So to give you a bit more of a picture of what this actually looks like in practice, uh, here's a very simple simulation of just hard octahedra. So again, sort of that billiard ball model, but now instead of spheres, you have octahedra. And you want to know what, what these things behave like if you uh, impose some sort of pressure on them, right? So here they're just packed together. So if you keep an eye on this, you'll notice that uh, over time, things sort of start to orient, right? You can see similar orientations popping up from the bottom, and you get a crystal, and it sort of percolates through your system. And this type of behavior is something that we want to capture in our simulations. But frequently, it's not so easy to quantify how this is happening, to understand the time scales it's happening on, or even to identify it at all. Uh, in this case, it's very simple, because you just have everything looking the same. But if you have more complex crystal structures, it could be very difficult. So one way you can maybe accomplish this is by looking at your system through the lens of some sort of order parameter, which is some way of characterizing the ordering in your system. So in, in this video, it's the same thing that I just showed you, uh, but instead it's colored by the Steinhardt order parameter, which is a way of quantifying sort of um, 
degrees of the, the rotational order around you by looking at what your neighbors typically look like. Um, and so now if you look, the, the coloring of the particles clearly will draw your eyes to the fact that there are certain light colored regions, and these are the regions where things are starting to cluster and look the same. And you'll notice there's a cluster at the bottom, a cluster at the top, and over time they've sort of percolated together. Um, so perhaps I will play that again really quickly to give you a second chance to see what this looks like. Um, so really, you see a little cluster at the top, there's a big one at the bottom, and then all of a sudden these two will join, and you end up with ordering across your entire system. Great. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the Freud library is implemented and what it's useful for. Um, the Freud library is, is meant to be highly scalable and efficient. We do this through uh, all of its internals are written in C++. We parallelize it with Intel threading building blocks, and we offer a Python wrapper around this using Cython. Um, this kind of scalability and efficiency has enabled us to study these kinds of million particle simulations, calculating things like the density fluctuations in a system, the correlation functions, and also how these particles are oriented or arranged with respect to one another. The Freud library is built around uh, NumPy APIs. We use NumPy arrays for all of our inputs and outputs, which allows you to uh, use Freud in a larger pipeline. So the kinds of tasks that you might envision doing this with would be uh, if you had a simulation that was running and you had, say, a callback function that could call out to Freud, ask for it to compute some order parameter about your system, and then complete the simulation when a certain amount of order has emerged. So for example, this top figure shows uh, particles colored by the Q6, that Steinhardt order parameter that we saw earlier. Um, and you might only need to simulate long enough to form a crystalline structure. Uh, other ways that you might consider this pipelining would be as if you had a, uh, a pipeline from simulation through analysis to visualization, as we showed earlier. Uh, oftentimes, uh, more modern approaches want to wrap problems like these into some kind of machine learning optimization, where you might be varying some kind of hyperparameters which control the uh, like physical elements of your simulation, like pressures and temperatures, or perhaps even the interactions that the particles undergo with one another. Um, so this is an overview of a few different applications where Freud has been used. Uh, it's been used in a number of papers. Uh, this one, for example, used uh, Freud's radial distribution functions as a fitness metric in order to optimize uh, pair potentials that would generate certain complex crystalline structures. Uh, order parameters in Freud have been used to distinguish liquid-like from solid-like particles in this work by Reinhardt. Um, this work by Chrissy Dew used uh, Freud's order parameters in order to inform the simulation and make sure that it would sample uh, in a way that optimized for a particular crystal structure uh, by varying the shape of the particles. And finally, this other work by Van Saders uh, has used Freud in order to calculate strain tensors in colloidal systems. A couple of the unique features in Freud uh, are potentials of mean force and torque and environment matching. Uh, the potential of mean force and torque is a way to think about how particles are arranged with respect to each other in a statistical way. If I have a particle, uh, and I might think about where its neighbors tend to be. For example, if I had a triangle, its neighbors are usually going to be aligned with its faces, not its vertices. Um, and so this is something that we can sample statistically through simulations. And over time, uh, these, uh, these statistical outcomes of where neighbors tend to be allow us to extract a free energy, which is something that we care about because it tells us something about the bonding nature of these particles. Uh, this is an example of how this has been applied in three-dimensional systems. So these are two-dimensional slices of something that is uh, a three-dimensional uh, image plot. So in this first row, you'll see that there's these tetrahedra. And like I was mentioning earlier, um, at a low density, these tetrahedra don't really care where they are with respect to one another because they're free to move around a lot. But as you increase the pressure of this simulation, these tetrahedra have to figure out how they're going to align more efficiently uh, so that they can compress into a smaller volume. And what you'll see is that there's this emergent free energy that you can see in the upper right-hand plot where um, there's a thin black line here depicting uh, the, the face of this triangle. And the wells that you can see in yellow uh, that are oriented around this are places where neighbors prefer to be. Uh, so this is really useful for us to understand uh, kind of emergent behaviors that occur in syst many systems of many particles. 
Uh, and you can visualize these in the two-dimensional slices as we've shown, or also as three-dimensional isoservices. Uh, another example that Freud has been used for is this environment matching. So in this picture, I'm showing you uh, a clustering of the particles, where the clusters are of similar local environments. In our field, uh, there's a couple of crystal structures which come up all the time. Uh, Face-centered cubic crystal structures are one of those. Body-centered cubic structures are another. Um, and so this is an example of where the dark blue and the light blue particles are both in face-centered cubic uh, crystalline structures. But as you can see between these, there's a layer of like thinner brown or orange. And uh, what this tells us is that there's a defect called a stacking fault. Using this environment matching tool in Freud, we're able to uh, look at a particle's neighbors and compute the vectors to each of those neighbors and take that set of vectors as a unique identifier for this environment. And if you look closely, you'll see that these layers uh, in the top row a and C, they're both triangles. Uh, there's three particles in each of those layers, but the triangles are oppositely oriented in this uh, FCC environment. Whereas in the stacking fault, which is something called a hexagonal close-packed structure, the triangles are actually oriented the same way. And so it's A and A instead of A and C. And this just has to do with how the particles prefer to fill the voids left by other layers of the crystal. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Vyas to talk a little bit about uh, neighbor finding and how this is an integral part of Freud. Thanks. So uh, Bradley's sort of given an overview of, of some of the core features in Freud. Uh, and one thing that you might have noticed in all of these, or in many of these at least, is that you're doing some sort of characterization of local environments, calculations that involve looking at particles and the other particles near them. right? And so this is a standard problem both in this type of analysis, but also in the underlying uh, molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo simulations, where you need to do some sort of locality lookup to figure out what particles are near me in order to calculate important quantities. And so in, in Freud, uh, we need to think about how you do this efficiently so that you can calculate these quantities for very large systems. One important uh, characteristic of the systems that we usually study is that they're periodic, right? Uh, and, and the reason that you care about periodicity is that in order for um, simulations to simulate something that appears infinite, you need to have these periodic boundary conditions so that particles can, uh, as long as your simulation is large enough, they effectively feel like they're in an infinite sea of particles because they can't see far enough to see copies of themselves. I'm sure that could be a little confusing, so here's our nice visualization for what periodic boundary conditions actually look like. So Pac-Man is sort of our favorite picture for this, right? Uh, if you look at what Pac-Man does, most of the box uh, where he's allowed to move around in is walled off. But right in the middle, you see these two, this, this channel, one on each side, where if he runs through it, he comes out the other end. Right? So this is a pretty good idea of how simulations tend to work for us, except you don't have any of these walls, typically. So a particle can run out of one side and come back to the other. And this is what we mean when we're thinking about nearest neighbors in these systems. So you can imagine that this complicates the actual nearest neighbor calculation. Right? So here, there's a diagram of a simulation box, that's the dotted line, along with sort of a slightly enlarged area where you can look at the periodic neighbors of, of, of particles. So if we focus on the particle labeled uh, 1 in red, that's in the top left of our simulation box, we see that uh, it doesn't really appear to have any immediate neighbors. Right? There's a little bit of white space around it, uh, below it and to the right. However, you also notice that, in fact, it has multiple periodic copies because it's so close to the edge. So for example, there is one shaded red particle at the bottom corresponding to its periodic image one down and one to the right. As a result, even though it appears to have no neighbors, in fact, it has one important neighbor, which is particle number two. Even though they're separated by top and bottom of the box, they're pretty far apart, their periodic images are right next to each other. And so we need efficient ways to calculate these kinds of neighbors. And in particular, we need to be able to do this for sort of arbitrarily shaped boxes, because that's often important when you need box, boxes that aren't just squares or cubes, if you want to capture different types of crystals that, insult, that, that themselves have some sort of intrinsic tilt or shape to their, to their structure. So we've implemented two different algorithms for doing this. Uh, one is, is a pretty standard technique that's used across various simulation tools, uh, but it's not so common in analysis, and it's uh, the linked cell list. And uh, briefly put, the idea with the linked cell list is to slice up your system into a bunch of smaller cells and bin particles into the cells. That allows you to do a faster lookup of which particles you have to consider as neighbors by just looking at cells neighboring your own cell. So you don't have to consider things far away from yourself when doing your distance calculations.
An alternative approach that tends to be uh, faster for heterogeneous systems is an axis aligned bounding box hierarchy. And so the idea with this is that each particle is assigned to uh, an independent axis aligned bounding box, and then you build up a binary tree recursively by merging neighboring boxes until you're able to eventually traverse this tree all the way down to figure out what neighbors you might have. So all of, uh, all of this code, since it's so central to a large number of our analyses, has been pretty highly optimized. So here's a, a performance plot showing how, how we do against um, SciPy's CKD tree. So the CKD tree is, of course, designed for a much more general, general purpose, right? It's, it's designed to work for arbitrarily dimensional data. And in general, people aren't using it for periodic systems, although it does support that. Um, because our, our systems are always, or almost always, periodic, and because we're only interested in two and three dimensions, we're able to optimize this quite a bit. And so you can see that not only do we get better performance, but the, the scaling behavior is nice, right? So this allows us to, to study much larger systems. So with that, we're gonna jump to a couple of quick live demonstrations to show exactly how, how one might use Freud and to demonstrate the APIs of Freud. Mm, there you go. Nope, more. There you go. There you go. All right. Uh, switch screens here. You want to pull it over? Yeah. Cool. Right. Uh, is this large enough? Can people in the back bigger? Can make it bigger? More. Yep. Just say one. Good. Okay. All right. Cool. Um. All right. So. Uh, this demonstration is going to uh, show how the Freud hexatic order parameter works. Uh, where is the other one? Here. Is see. it down? I think if we close oh. this, it'll actually replicate. Yeah. Anyway, while this is coming up. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about this. Let's go. There you go. There you go. Um, so the hexatic order parameter is a way to characterize ordering in two-dimensional systems. So uh, frequently, we like to study the simplest type of system you can get. Um, and so if you're interested in behavior at some sort of boundary or at a surface, you can study it in just two dimensions. And the hexatic order parameter is a way to characterize ordering in these systems. So the math is up there, but the, the important thing is that we're trying to do some sort of characterization of local environments by looking at angles, again, those vectors between particles and their neighbors. And the hexatic order parameter says that we can do this in two dimensions by just looking at one parameter, which is just this angle. So in particular, what we're talking about is the hexatic order, order parameter, so six-fold order. And what you expect to see then, if you imagine a clock, is you expect to find neighbors at 2 two o'clock, 4 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 8 o'clock, and 10 o'clock. Right? That's what you would expect to see if you had hexatic order. Um, and so this is sort of the simple way to calculate this using complex exponentials. So in this first cell, all we're doing is just importing some stuff, nothing too interesting. Um, in order to do this calculation, we're going to load some sample data. So this is from like an actual simulation related to one of the papers that we showed earlier. Uh, the important lines here are, are up here. So this creates a Freud object, uh, the hexatic order parameter, and it provides it some, some information in its constructor. And then there's this compute call, which provides it the system box, which you always need, right? especially if you have these periodic systems, uh, and you provide it the particle positions. So that's really all you need to do in order to calculate pretty much anything in Freud. There's a construction step and a compute step, and that lets you do pretty much everything you want. Uh, the rest of this is pretty much just plotting code, so we can have a look at uh, how the system behaves. So this was you know, calculation done on the fly, but pretty fast. Uh, this is looking at a system of hexagons that are at about 65% density. So the thing to note here is that there is a large distribution of colors. There's not a whole lot of uh, spots that are highly dense in one area with the same color. And this is because the system isn't terribly dense. So particles still have quite a bit of freedom to move and rotate around. Now, as you get denser, you expect to find that this changes. So now if we look at a 75% uh, packing fraction for the system, you see that all of a sudden there's a pretty uniform color gradient everywhere because all of our particles are now being forced to align in certain ways and, and to uh, have a similar alignment across the system. However, you can see that there's various white spots that are kind of patchy throughout the system. And these indicate things kind of like the stacking fault that we showed earlier in the environment matching demonstration. Uh, these are all the areas where you have misalignments and they're disfavored, but not so strongly because there still is enough free space in the system that you can afford to have some of these. 
as you get to even higher densities, though, uh, you see that this sort of goes away, and you get pretty much perfect ordering. So here, once you're dense enough, everything is pretty much perfectly ordered through your system. And this is about like the kind of thing that you'd expect. So this is one example of sort of a, a, a simple parameter you can calculate with, with Freud, but it allows you to very easily and dynamically figure out what exactly your system is doing uh, over the course of a simulation. Super cheap, so this is something you could actually do while you're simulating. Uh, so now Bradley's gonna start talking about some slightly more complicated use cases for Freud. Right. So uh, a, popular, a popular problem in our field is uh, you want to run a lot of simulations, some of which might generate crystal structures that are not uh, simple, like the face-centered cubic and body-centered cubic that we described earlier. And so when this happens, uh, you usually have to find some way to either cut apart the crystal and look at it uh, one unit cell at a time, or to generate some kinds of metrics that help you to identify what that crystal structure is. Uh, so this demonstration is, is showing how we can use machine learning uh, as a tool to help us identify in an automated way what different crystal structures are. Um, so what we're going to do here is uh, we're going to import Freud and we're going to use a set of features that we're calculating with Freud as inputs to a support vector machine that allows us to uh, tell different crystal structures apart. So if we do that, we're going to generate a training set of data here, which is a combination of uh, body-centered cubic crystals, face-centered cubic crystals, and simple cubic crystals. Uh, each of these structures has 4,000 particles, and we, we uh, add some Gaussian noise to the particles so that their environments are not all the same. Uh, so if we do this, we're going to uh, run a computation where we find these particles' neighbors, and we use those neighbors uh, through the Steinhardt uh, order parameters, as we described earlier. And by doing this for a variety of different L values, we're looking at fourfold, sixfold, up to 12-fold ordering uh, in three dimensions using spherical harmonics. And so this computation um, goes through all of these particles, finds neighbors, puts those through the spherical harmonics, and uses um, an expression that allows us to construct a scalar parameter that tells us about the, uh, about the ordering of each particle. So if we do this, uh, let's see what an individual descriptor alone, like Q4 or Q6, tells us about these structures. Uh, if we plot this, we can see that, um, as it plots, uh, it's still computing features. There we are. So the, the Q4 order parameter here does a decent job of distinguishing BCC, FCC, and simple cubic structures. But as you can see, there's also significant overlap in the bottoms here of these uh, histograms. And so what we can tell is that this order parameter alone is not enough to tell what these crystal structures are. If we look at Q6, similarly, this is something that is not enough to tell apart BCC and FCC, but it does help us give uh, uh, clear identification for simple cubic because it's in a very uh, separated uh, part of the histogram. But if we were to combine these with the other descriptors that we also calculated, uh, we can build a pandas data frame that combines these features and then use that as input to a support vector machine. And so this is a, a common tool in machine learning uh, that is good for separating uh, good for separating classes that are relatively well distinguished in their, uh, the higher dimensional space of all these parameters. And if we do that, we can fit to it, and we see that we have less than 2% error on our testing data, which is a third of the particles that we pulled off randomly from the beginning part of this. Um, and so, you know, if we wanted to go further, we might want to understand why these structures are distinguishable from one another. Uh, here I'm using the uniform manifold approximation and projection method, which is a way to map from a higher dimensional space to a lower dimensional space um, in a way that preserves uh, the distance and topologies of the, of the space as we convert it down to two dimensions. This was uh, talked about last year by Leland McInnes at SciPy, and uh, we've been using this productively in our research uh, to help us identify different structures. So if we look at this plot, uh, we can tell pretty clearly that the classes are, are well distinguished from one another. There's a few cases where um, BCC and FCC are mistaken for one another, and that's because uh, when you add an, enough Gaussian noise, it's easy to confuse those two structures if the noise is added in the wrong way. 
um, for a particular particle. So that's an example of the kinds of things that you might want to do with Freud, wrapping it in uh, visualization, machine learning problems, and helping us to do better analyses of crystal structures. So, sorry, jump to the end here. So in all, uh, Freud is meant to be an efficient particle analysis library using NumPy arrays for inputs and outputs. Uh, it's specifically designed for a lot of the problems faced by computational material scientists, and especially those focused on like nanoparticles and colloidal systems. Um, we welcome contributions. Uh, we have a lot of people who have uh, added features to this from within our lab and also some externally. Um, and with that, we'd like to conclude. Uh, we'd like to thank the funding agencies that have supported this work, uh, the DOD, the NSF among them. Um, you can check us out on GitHub. We also made a Slack channel called Freud that you can see the links to our project and the documentation as well as the examples that we showed in this, uh, in this presentation. And thank you so much for coming. So uh, I'll just pull that up again. This guy right here. Next, yeah. Yeah. So um, these are these are uh, integer classes. These are cluster IDs that we're coloring by. So the two primary clusters are the large dark blue one, which crosses the periodic boundary, and the center one, which is like a lighter blue. Uh, the other ones that you see here that are interjected in between, which are like reds and greens and things like that. They're not one of the four that we've listed here. Uh, those, are, those are particles whose environments had enough noise in them that they couldn't be identified as any of the others. I was thinking more of the light blue and the dark blue. Why are those polyhedra not all identical in, in terms of their uh, So they're actually uh, different clusters because the clusters are separated by this other layer. So they're, they're the same as one another, except uh, they're inverted, uh, the layers are are differently aligned. So it's as if it's going like A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. Sorry, sorry, I guess I'm still on the way. Within light blue. Yes. Those don't all look identical. The light blue ones are all the same. So yeah. I think it's, it's maybe just hard to see. Yeah. I think it's partly visualization. One thing to keep in mind is that any, like the sort of method does have some sort of thresholds that are built into it. And so they're similar enough that you can identify a domain. Um, you could use something like machine learning to figure out what are good thresholds. Here we've picked the one that identifies this one very well. Um, yeah. There was one over there. So I know a big problem with granular dynamic simulations is when you start having a wide variety of, uh, say, particle sizes. Are you able to handle Admixtures of sizes or varieties of sizes of particles, or do they generally have the same? Right. So um, this is a good question. The the inputs to Freud are particle positions. So uh, in that case, you would end up having points that are further separated, centers of mass of each particle, which are further separated from each other. And the the things that you would want to consider in a in a widely poly dispersed system like that. Uh, you would want to make sure that your neighbor finding, your choices of neighbor finding algorithms are uh, accounting for the ways that you want to find neighbors. For example, if you were looking at a fixed neighbor distance cutoff, that's probably going to be different for particles that are larger than particles that are smaller. So there's a few different ways you can find neighbors in Freud. You can use a distance cutoff, you can use a fixed number of nearest neighbors, um, and you can also use a Voronoi construction. Um, in order to find neighbors. And I would recommend for one of those kinds of cases, either the k-nearest neighbors or the Voronoi construction for a polydispersed system. Yeah. 
Right, so, so different literature in the field has used features like those. Um, we chose this set of features for this example because it's relatively simple. Um, Right, so this is, this is sort of an open problem in the field, right? Yeah. General features that can apply to many different crystal structures. Um, it's something that some people are working on, um, but yeah, it's largely an unresolved problem how to choose which features are best. Thank you. All right, uh, let's thank the presenters and ask the next presenter to come up if there's...